let's take a look at major federal employment laws that managers need to know. Labor law, also known as labor law or employment law, mediates the relationship between workers, employing entities, trade unions, and the government. Collective labor law relates to the tripart relationship between the employee, employer, and the union. The Fair Labor Standards Act, known as the FLSA of 1938, establishes the federal minimum wage and rules related to overtime pay, both eligibility and rates, record keeping, and child labor. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 prohibits unequal pay for males and females doing substantially similar work. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, known as also as sex, or national origin. The Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967 prohibits discrimination in employment decisions against persons age 40 or older. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 prohibits discrimination in employment against pregnant women. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 prohibits discrimination on the basis of physical or mental disabilities. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 strengthened the provisions of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by providing for jury trials and punitive damages. The Family Medical Leave Act of 1993 permits workers to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave for pregnancy and or birth of a new child, adoption, or foster care of a new child, illness of an immediate family member, or personal medical leave. The Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994 prohibits discrimination against those serving in the Armed Forces or the Reserve, the National Guard, and other uniformed services, and guarantees that civilian employers will hold and restore civilian jobs. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 prohibits discrimination on the basis of genetic information. In addition, there are two important sets of federal laws, labor laws and the laws and regulations governing safety standards. Labor laws regulate the interaction between management and labor unions that represent groups of employees. The EEOC has investigatory, enforcement, and informational responsibilities. Therefore, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission investigates charges of discrimination, enforces the employment discrimination laws in federal court, and publishes guidelines that organizations can use to ensure they're in compliance with the law. One of the most important guidelines jointly issued by the EEOC, the U.S. Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Justice, and the Federal Office of Personnel Management is the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, which can be read in its entirety at www.uniformguidelines.com. These guidelines define two important criteria, disparate treatment and adverse impact, which are used in determining whether companies have engaged in discriminatory hiring and promotion practices. Disparate treatment, which is intentional discrimination, occurs when people, despite being qualified, are intentionally not given the same hiring, promotion, or membership opportunities as other employees because of a protected class. Largely, a key element of discrimination lawsuits is establishing motive, meaning that the employer intended to discriminate. If no motive can be established, then a claim of disparate treatment may actually be a case of adverse impact. Adverse impact, which is unintentional discrimination, occurs when members of a particular race, sex, age, or ethnic group are unintentionally harmed or disadvantaged because they're hired, promoted, or trained, or any other employment decision substantially lower rates than other people. The courts and federal agencies use the four-fifths or 80% rule to determine adverse impact. Adverse impact is determined by calculating the impact ratio, which divides the decision rate for a protected group of people by the decision rate of a non-protected group, usually white males. If the impact ratio is less than 80%, then adverse impact may have occurred. For example, if 20 out of 100 black applicants are hired, 20 divided by 100 is 20%, but 60 applicants are hired, 60 out of 100, or 60%, then adverse impact has occurred because the impact ratio is less than 80%,
0.2 divided by 0.6 equals 33%. Violation of the four-fifths rule is not an automatic indication of discrimination, however. If an employer can demonstrate that a selection procedure or test is valid, meaning that the test accurately predicts job performance or that the test is job-related because it assesses applicants on specific tasks actually used in the job, then the organization may continue to use the test. If validity cannot be established, however, then a violation of the four-fifths rule will likely result in a lawsuit brought by the employees, job applicants, or the EEOC itself. According to the EEOC, sexual harassment is a form of discrimination in which unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature occurs. From a legal perspective, there are two kinds of sexual harassment, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Quid pro quo sexual harassment occurs when employment outcomes such as hiring, promotion, or simply keeping one's job depends on whether an individual submits to being sexually harassed. A hostile work environment occurs when unwelcome and demeaning sexually related behavior creates an intimidating, hostile, and offensive work environment. In contrast to quid pro quo cases, a hostile work environment may not result in economic injury. It's important that organizations take the time to write clear, understandable sexual harassment policy that's strongly worded, gives specific examples of what constitutes sexual harassment, spells out sanctions and punishments, and is widely publicized within the company. This lets potential harassers and victims know what will not be tolerated and how the organization will deal with harassment should it occur. Job analysis is a purposeful, systematic process for collecting information on the important work-related aspects of a job. Job analysis typically collects four kinds of information. Work activities, such as what workers do and how, when, and why they do it. The tools and equipment used to do the job. The context in which the job is performed, such as the actual working conditions or schedule, and the personnel requirements for performing the job, meaning the knowledge, skills, and abilities, known as KSAs, needed to do the job well. Job analysis information can be collected by having incumbents or supervisors complete questionnaires about their jobs, by direct observation, by interviews, or by filming employees as they perform their jobs. Job descriptions and job specifications are two of the most important results of job analysis. A job description is a written description of the basic tasks, duties, and responsibilities required of an employee holding a particular job. Job specifications, which are often included as a separate section of a job description, are a summary of the qualifications needed to successfully perform the job. Because a job analysis specifies what a job entails, as well as the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are needed to do the job well, companies must complete job analysis before beginning to recruit job applicants. Job analysis, job descriptions, and job specifications are the foundation on which all critical human resource activities are built. Job descriptions are also used throughout the staffing process to ensure that the selection devices and the decisions based on those devices are job-related. For example, the questions asked in an interview should be based on the most important work activities identified by job analysis. Likewise, during performance appraisals, employees should be evaluated in areas of job analysis identified as the most important to the job. Recruiting is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants. Internal recruiting is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants from people who already work in the company. Internal recruiting, sometimes called promotion from within, involves employee commitment, morale, and motivation. Recruiting current employees also reduces recruitment startup time and costs, and because employees are already familiar with the company's culture and procedures, they're more likely to succeed in new jobs. Job posting is a procedure for advertising job openings within the company to existing employees. A job description and requirements are typically posted on a bulletin board, in a company newsletter, or in internal computerized job banks that are accessible only to employees. 
A career path is a planned sequence of jobs through which employees may advance within an organization. External recruiting is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants from outside the company. External recruitment methods include advertising, newspapers, magazines, direct mail, radio, or television, employee referrals, asking current employees to recommend possible job applicants, walk-ins, people who apply on their own, outside organizations like universities, trade schools, or professional societies, employment services like state or private employment agencies, temporary help agencies, and professional search firms, special events like career conferences and job fairs, internet job sites like CareerBuilder or Glassdoor.com, and social media like LinkedIn or Facebook, as well as career portals on companies' websites. Which external recruiting method should you use? Historically, studies show that employee referrals, walk-ins, advertisements, and state employment agencies tend to be used most frequently for office and clerical and production and service employees. By contrast, advertisements and college or university recruiting are most frequently used for professional and technical employees. When recruiting managers, organizations tend to rely most heavily on advertisements, employee referrals, and search firms. One of the biggest trends in recruiting is identifying passive candidates, people who are not actively seeking a job but who might be receptive to a change. Why pursue passive candidates? About half of all workers would be willing to change jobs if recruited by another company. Some companies are even hosting virtual career or job fairs, where job applicants click on recruiting booths and learn more about a company, see the kinds of available jobs, and speak with company representatives via video chat or instant message. Selection is the process of gathering information about job applicants to decide who should be offered a job. To make sure that selection decisions are accurate and legally defendable, the EEOC's, or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's, uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures recommend that all selection procedures be validated. Validation is the process of determining how well a selection test or procedure predicts future job performance. The better or more accurate the prediction of future job performance, the more valid a test is said to be. The next selection devices that the most job applicants encounter when they seek a job are application forms and resumes. Both contain similar information about an applicant, such as a name, address, job educational history, and so forth. Though an organization's application form often asks for information already provided by the applicant's resumes, most organizations prefer to collect this information in their own format for entry into a human resource information system known as an HRIS. Employment laws apply to application forms just as they do all other selection devices. Application forms may ask applicants for only valid, job-related information. Nonetheless, application forms commonly ask applicants for non-job related information such as marital status, maiden name, age, or date of high school graduation. Nearly all organizations ask an applicant to provide employment references such as the names of previous employers or coworkers whom they can contact to learn more about the candidate. Background checks are used to verify the truthfulness and accuracy of information that applicants provide about themselves and to uncover negative, job-related background information not provided by applicants. Background checks are conducted by contacting educational institutions prior to employers, court records, police and government agencies, and other informational sources either by telephone, mail, remote computer access, or through in-person investigations. Unfortunately, previous employers are increasingly reluctant to provide references or background check information for fear of being sued by previous employees for defamation. If former employers provide potential employers with unsubstantiated information that damages applicants' chances of being hired, applicants can and do sue for defamation. As a result, 54% of employers will not provide information about previous employees. Many provide only dates of employment, positions held, and date of separation. 
When previous employers declined to provide meaningful references or background information, they put other employers at risk of negligent hiring lawsuits, in which an employer is held liable for the actions of an employee who would have not have been hired if the employer had conducted a thorough reference search and background check. Selection tests give organizational decision makers a chance to know who they're likely to do the best job and who won't. Pre-hiring assessments are growing in popularity, with 57% of large U.S. employers using some sort of pre-hiring test to ensure better fit. Specific ability tests measure the extent to which an applicant possesses a particular kind of ability needed to do a job well. Specific ability tests are also called aptitude tests because they measure aptitude for doing a particular task well. Cognitive ability tests measure the extent to which applicants have abilities in perceptual speed, verbal comprehension, numerical aptitude, general reasoning, and spatial aptitude. Biographical data, or biodata, are extensive surveys that ask applicants questions about their personal backgrounds and life experiences. The basic idea behind biodata is that past behavior, personal background, and life experience is the best predictor of future behavior. An individual's personality is made up of a relatively stable set of behaviors, attitudes, and emotions displayed over time. In short, it is personality that makes people different from each other. A personality test measures the extent to which an applicant possesses different kinds of job-related personality dimensions. Work sample tests, also called performance tests, require applicants to perform tasks that they actually do on the job. So, unlike specific ability tests, cognitive ability tests, biographical data surveys, and personality tests, which are indirect predictors of job performance, work sample tests directly measure job applicants' capability to do the job. Assessment centers use a series of job-specific simulations that are graded by multiple trained observers to determine applicants' ability to perform managerial work. Unlike the previously described selection tests that are commonly used for specific jobs or entry-level jobs, assessment centers are most often used to select applicants who are high potential to be good managers. Assessment centers often last two to five days and require participants to complete a number of tests and exercises that simulate management work. In interviews, company representatives ask job applicants job-related questions to determine whether they're qualified for a job. Interviews are probably the most frequently used and relied upon selection device. There are several basic kinds of interviews, unstructured, structured, and semi-structured. In unstructured interviews, interviewers are free to ask applicants anything they want and studies show that they do. Because interviewers often disagree about which questions should be asked during interviews, different interviewers tend to ask applicants very different questions. Furthermore, individual interviews seem to have a tough time asking the same questions from one interview to the next. The high level of variety can make things difficult. As a result, while unstructured interviews do predict job performance with some success, they're about half as accurate as structured interviews at predicting which job applicants would be hired. By contrast with structured interviews, standard interview questions are prepared ahead of time so that applicants are asked the same job-related questions. Structuring interviews also ensures that interviewers ask only important job-related information. Not only are the accuracy, usefulness, and validity of the interview improved, but the chances that interviewers will ask questions about topics that violate employment laws are reduced. Semi-structured interviews lie between structured and unstructured interviews. A major part of the semi-structured interview, perhaps as much as 80%, is based on structured questions. But some time is set aside for unstructured interviewing to allow the interviewer to probe into ambiguous or missing information uncovered during the structured portion of the interview. How well do interviews predict future job performance? Contrary to what you've probably heard, recent evidence indicates that even unstructured interviews do a fairly good job. When conducted properly, however, structured interviews can lead to much more accurate hiring decisions than unstructured interviews do. In some cases, the validity of structured interviews can rival that of cognitive ability tests. 
Training means providing opportunities for employees to develop job-specific skills, experience, and knowledge they need to do their jobs or to improve performance. American organizations spend an estimated $189 billion a year on training. Needs assessment is the process of identifying and prioritizing the learning needs of employees. Needs assessment can be conducted by identifying performance deficiencies, listening to customer complaints, surveying employees and managers, or formally testing employees' skills and knowledge. There are a number of training methods you could use. Films and videos, lectures, planned readings, case studies, coaching and mentoring, group discussions, and on-the-job training, just to name a few. To choose the best method, you should consider a number of factors, such as the number of people to be trained, the cost of training, and the objectives of the training. These days, many organizations are adapting internet training or computer-based learning. E-learning can offer several advantages. Because employees don't need to leave their jobs, travel costs are greatly reduced. Also, because employees can take care of training modules when it's convenient for them, that is, they don't have to fall behind on their jobs or attend week-long training sessions, workplace productivity should increase and employee stress should decrease. And if a company's technology infrastructure can support it, e-learning can be much faster than traditional training methods. There are, however, several disadvantages of e-learning. First, despite its popularity, it's not always the most appropriate training method, depending on the content to deliver. Second, e-learning requires a significant investment in computers and high-speed internet, as well as other technology investment for all employees. Finally, e-learning can be boring to some employees. E-learning may become more interesting, however, as companies incorporate game-like features such as avatars and competition into their e-learning courses. Performance appraisal is the process of assessing how well employees are doing in their jobs. Most employees and managers intensely dislike the performance appraisal process. In fact, 65% of employees are dissatisfied with their performance appraisal process. Likewise, according to the Society for Human Resource Management, 95% of human resource managers are dissatisfied with their organization's performance appraisal systems. Indeed, performance appraisals are used for four broad purposes, making administrative decisions, providing feedback for employee development, evaluating human resource programs, and for documentation purposes. Workers often have strong doubts about the accuracy of their performance appraisals, and they might be right. For example, it's widely known that assessors are prone to errors while rating worker performance. Three of the most common rating errors are central tendency, halo, and leniency. Central tendency error occurs when assessors rate all workers as average or in the middle of the scale. Halo error occurs when assessors rate all workers as performing at the same level, good, bad, or average, in all parts of their jobs. Leniency error occurs when assessors rate all workers as performing particularly well. One of the reasons managers make these errors is that they often don't spend enough time gathering or reviewing performance data. Facebook reduces appraisal errors by having managers work together to finalize performance ratings. What can be done to minimize rating errors and improve the accuracy in which job performance is measured? In general, two approaches have been used, improving performance appraisal measures themselves and training performance raters to be more accurate. One of the ways companies try to improve performance appraisal measures is to use as many objective performance measures as possible. Objective performance measures are measures of performance that are easily and directly counted or quantified. Common objective performance measures include output, scrap, waste, sales, customer complaints, and rejection rates. But when objective performance measures aren't available, and frequently they aren't, subjective performance measures have to be used instead. Subjective measures require that someone judge or assess a worker's performance. The second approach to improving the measurement of workers' job performance is rater training. The most effective is frame of reference training, in which groups of trainees learn how to do performance appraisals by watching a video of an employee at work. Next, they evaluate the performance of the person in the video. A trainer, an expert in the subject matter, then shares his or her evaluations and trainees' evaluations are compared with the experts. 
The expert then explains the rationales behind his or her evaluations. The process is repeated until differences in evaluations given by trainees and evaluations by the expert are minimized. After gathering accurate performance data, the next step is to share performance feedback with employees. Unfortunately, even when performance appraisal ratings are accurate, the appraisal process often breaks down at the feedback stage. Employees will become defensive and dislike hearing any negative assessments of their work no matter how small. Managers become defensive too and dislike giving performance appraisal feedback as much as employees like receiving it. In response, many companies are asking managers to ease up on harsh feedback and instead articulate the positive by focusing on employee strengths. What can be done to overcome the inherent difficulties in performance appraisal feedback? First, be mindful of being overly critical and making employees so defensive they quit listening. Also, because performance appraisal ratings have traditionally been judgments of just one person, the boss, another possibility is to use 360-degree feedback. In this approach, feedback comes from four sources, the boss, subordinates, peers, coworkers, and the employees themselves. The advantage of 360-degree feedback programs is that negative feedback is often more credible when it comes from several people. Compensation includes both the financial and non-financial rewards that organizations give to employees in exchange for their work. There are three basic kinds of compensation decisions, pay level, pay variability, and pay structure. Pay level decisions concern whether to pay workers at a level that is below, above, or at current market wages. Companies use job evaluation to set their pay structures. Job evaluation determines the worth of each job by determining the market value of the knowledge, skills, and requirements needed to perform it. After conducting a job evaluation, most companies try to pay the going rate, meaning the current market wage. There are always companies, however, whose financial situation causes them to pay considerably less or considerably more than current market wages. Some companies choose to pay above average wages to attract and keep employees. Above average market wages can attract a larger, more qualified pool of job applicants, increase the rate of job acceptance, decrease the time it takes to fill positions, and increase the time that employees stay. Pay variability decisions concern the extent to which employees' pay varies with individual and organizational performance. Linking pay to performance is intended to increase employee motivation, effort, and performance. Piecework, sales commissions, profit sharing, employee stock ownership plans, and stock options are common pay variability options. Under a sales commission plan, salespeople are paid a percentage of the purchase price of items that they sell. With profit sharing, employees receive a portion of the organization's profit over and above their regular compensation. Employee stock ownership plans, known as ESOPs, compensate employees by awarding them shares of the company's stock in addition to their regular compensation. Stock options give employees the right to purchase shares of stock at a set price. Pay structure decisions are concerned with internal pay distributions, meaning the extent to which people in the company receive very different levels of pay. With hierarchical pay structures, there are big differences from one pay level to another. The highest pay levels are for people near the top of the pay distribution. The basic idea behind hierarchical pay structures is that large differences in pay between jobs or organizational levels should motivate people to work harder to obtain those higher paying jobs. By contrast, compressed pay structures typically have fewer levels and smaller differences between pay levels. Pay is less dispersed and more similar across the company. The basic idea behind compressed pay structures is that similar pay levels should lead to higher levels of cooperation, feelings of fairness and a common purpose, and better group and team performance. So should companies choose hierarchical or compressed pay structures? The evidence isn't straightforward, but studies seem to indicate that there are significant problems with the hierarchical approach. The most challenging and damaging finding is that there appears to be a link between organizational performance and the pay of top managers. Likewise, they are twice as likely to quit their jobs when their companies have very strong hierarchical pay structures. 
For now, it seems that hierarchical pay structures work best for independent work, where it's easy to determine the contributions of individual performance and little coordination with others is needed to get the job done.